So, you want to hear the truth about Viktor Gjokeric. You've read so many transfer links, you've heard about how lethal he has been for sporting this season. Perhaps you're aware that he has more goal contributions than Kane and Bappe and all of your favorite attackers. Now it's time to get the real details about this honestly terrifying striker. Someone who, as a Benfica supporter, made me tweet this back in December as his goal count was surging. So to get the truth about this guy, to get more substance than a few hyped tweets showing his skill comps, his mysterious celebrations, or his numbers in isolation, let's speak to someone who has watched him grow, match in, match out, every minute played, every goal, every assist. Hey, I'm Adrian, and today we'll speak with Danny, a sporting fan and part of All Things Alvalad, your hub for news coverage and podcasts surrounding everything sporting. In English, all of their links are below, so be sure to give them a follow to keep monitoring guys like Amarim and Gjokeres. As a Benfica supporter, those guys need to leave Portugal stacked. I'm joking. I'm joking. Before we get into who Gjokeres is and what makes him so good, it's worth noting that Premier League clubs fumbled him big time. I won't detail every moment and everyone Gjokeres has ever met in his life. But some context and background is always important and appreciated. By the way, he has Hungarian ancestry, a mighty Magyar from Sweden. He started out in the academy of IF Brumapoikarna, <laughs> the same academy that Dejan Kulusevski was a part of at a young age. I nailed that pronunciation, by the way. According to a scout named David Eklund, who spoke to iNews, Gjokeres wasn't really the star of the academy, which has built up quite the reputation of developing young talent in Sweden. But all the same, he began developing into quite the player at the U19 and U21 level for Broma Poikarma. And in three seasons with the senior squad, he scored 25 goals from 67 appearances, adding a further nine assists in that time frame as well, which, by the way, that was from the ages of 17 to 19. And when he turned 19, or shortly before, he moved to Brighton, and upon arriving said, quote, Initially, the big goal is to play in the Premier League. That's what I see before me. Then there are more goals in the future, but they will come soon. Now this seems like a very Brighton-like move, doesn't it? Sign a young talent for about a million euros, turn him into an absolute beast, and then inevitably lose him to Chelsea, right? Well, things didn't go to plan, really. After joining in January of 2018, he didn't make his debut until the following season, making just five appearances for Brighton in cup competitions, and then sent on loan to St. Pauli for the 2019-20 season, where he scored seven goals in 26 Bundesliga 2 appearances. So far, pretty mixed. It felt like his career was maybe not spiraling, but a little off course at least. As Gjokeres was sent to Swansea for the 2020-21 championship season, but scored just once in 12 appearances, and was subsequently recalled and sent on loan to Coventry in January of that same season. Bit of a whirlwind, eh? But at Coventry, he scored three goals in 19 appearances, and they made his move permanent for just 1.2 million euros. He never made a Premier League appearance. In the following two seasons, Gjokeres would get better and better settling in at Coventry and beginning to excel and deliver on the potential he showed back in Sweden. In his first full season, despite a barren run of 15 matches without a goal, he was a constant threat. And that was just an appetizer for what was to come. In his second full season with Coventry, 22-23, he morphed into the striker that he resembles today. A terrifying prospect for defenders, becoming known for how he would run at defenders with the ball, beat them on the dribble, and finish with power. He wasn't a striker that needed service in order to score goals. He could create chances for himself with how good he was on the ball. With his pace and lethal finishing, he was the perfect striker for manager Mark Robbins' counter-attacking side. But another area where he began to excel under Robbins was bringing his teammates into the match, combining with them, and setting up goals for them as well. In his second full season, Gjokeres scored 22 goals and set up a further 12 in 50 appearances. He helped Coventry make the promotion playoff final by setting up the winning goal against Middlesbrough in the semi-finals. He also set up the equalizer in the final, but Coventry fell to Luton on penalties, denying Gjokeres of reaching the Premier League and potentially making an appearance in the Premier League. Once again, it just slipped past him. But he had attracted the attention of clubs across Europe by then, and even though Coventry wouldn't be going to the Premier League, the general feeling was that Jokeres would end up there. But that move never came about. 
Now, why didn't that move come around? From everything I've read, there was ample opportunity for any of England's top clubs, even mid-table clubs, to match Sporting's final offer. So why didn't it come about? Just oversight by the Premier League clubs? Definitely a lot of oversight. I think the only team that we were really competing with, there was a few murmurs, but the, the biggest threats I think were Everton. It's safe to say that when, a, when England, no matter what the team is, whether you're mid-table, battling relegation, when England comes calling, players want to go there. Players want to play in the best league in the world. They want that exposure. But Amurin, Verandas, and, and Hugo Viana, our director of football, definitely sold the Spartan project. They definitely sold to Gioqueras. He's going to be playing in, in the Europa League and definitely competing for titles, whereas that's something, at least at the moment, Everton couldn't provide for him. I think it also, we sold him the dream that this is just a bridge into a top team in England as well, right? Rather than playing for the Everton's or the mid-table teams, after Sparting, you know, any of the top three in Portugal, really, you can then go on to the to the Liverpools, the Cities, the Uniteds, and, and the Arsenals that he's now linked to. You know, whether it be Sparting, whether it be Befica, whether it be Porto. So I guess we sold him that dream that, you know, you can come maybe win the league with Sparting or at least compete, show a decent showing, and then go on and, and go to a bigger club and not just try to survive in England. It's the classic tale with a ton of English clubs, eh? Buy them when they're young and promising and just need a year or so to develop? Hell no. We'd rather overpay when they are developed by someone else, cheekiness aside. But it's true. Joining any of the top clubs in Portugal can indeed provide talents with those three things that Danny mentioned. A chance to play in European competitions as well. A chance at winning silverware. And if you perform, then the likelihood of being acquired by a top top club in any of the big leagues is basically a guarantee at this point. On top of that, he would get to play under one of the most sought after managers in Europe at the moment, Ruben Amarim, which cannot be understated. That's also a huge benefit to him. But back to the finances for a second. For Portuguese clubs, spending over 20 million euros is a big, big deal. And typically that brings a lot of skepticism and scrutiny on how those valuable funds are being spent. Sparting, we're not we're not used to spending such large money. I mean, he's our transfer uh, record fee, right? Of 20 million plus add-ons. Few of us were worried that you know we're spending all this money on a striker when we need you know more midfielders. We need a winger. We just lost Boru and we had Ishgayu at right back, so we're you know we need to plug that hole in. But I think the general consensus, it's safe to say, everybody was excited because just from the clips we were able to see to how far he brought Coventry, not him alone, but he was obviously a big part of that Coventry team that almost made the Premier League. Sporting had been like screaming for a striker over the last few years that can really convert all his chances. Generally, there was excitement there. There was some skepticism, but for the most part, definitely excitement. And I mean, it's, it's paid off, right? Yeah, it's paid off in a big, big way. Victor Gjokeres, as mentioned in the intro, is the first player this season to reach 50 goal contributions. And he's done so in just 39 matches. He's averaging 1.28 goal contributions every single match, with 36 goals and 14 assists this season. Not only has he been a success personally, but he's lifted sporting in general. Paulinho last year in the league had five league goals. He's now up to 11. Gioqueres has Paulinho scoring goals, which is something crazy for us Sparty fans to think of because he squandered more chances than he scored in the past. Now he's looking like a completely different man. Him lifting Paulinho so much sort of <laughs> reminded me of when uh, when Juan Felix managed to make Seferovic not look like a total bum that one. Yeah, season. exactly. It's sharing more of the wealth. I wish I could say Gioqueres is, although he's our top goal scorer, he's the only one scoring goals, but it's a team effort. I mean, last weekend we won 6-1. We've won you know, 6-1 in the past. I think the largest margin of victory was 8 nothing or something like that, or 8-1 this year. It's been crazy. And it's not all just Victor scoring. I think that, like this last weekend was his first hat trick. He sometimes gets a double. For the most part, he'll get a goal and then he'll chill out for the rest of the game and just cause havoc. So what kind of player is he? As you've heard, he's not just a pure scorer. He brings in his teammates well. Part of that is due to how comfortable he is on the ball. But what kind of striker does Danny consider him to be? He's a fast brute with endless stamina. My favorite quality of his is it doesn't matter if it's the first minute or the 95th minute, he's chasing every single ball down, sprinting until he can't anymore, right? If I have to label him as something, more than anything, he's just a workhorse, which I think gives him the ability to 
be on the end of crosses or be at the end of and scoring goals or even helping out his teammates getting the goal in as well. He's a striker we don't often see in Portugal either, right? Like Portugal tends to favor, depending on how you play, but tends to favor the target mans, tends to favor the deep lying strikers as well, right? Like the false nine sort of, whereas he's just like the complete forward in my mind, right? I think that one of the scariest things is just him with space on the ball yeah. even because he's not necessarily one who's gonna throw out a bunch of step overs and blow by a defender that way, but just through that sheer pace that he has, mm -hmm. bang it around the defender, whatever, that's where I get terrified. And the analytics back this up. No, you won't see him hit step over after step over, then a roulette and beat 12 players in that way. But given his sheer pace and solid ball control, he can blow by players. And in fact, according to Opta numbers via FB Ref, he is in the 99th percentile when it comes to successful take-ons per 90 with 2.29. He's also in the 99th percentile when it comes to progressive carries, progressive passes, and shot creating actions per 90, amongst other analytics as well. To put it simply, coupled with his ridiculous stamina, he's a defender's nightmare. He will run at you and run at you, and if he beats you, well, good luck to your keeper. It's not even like he's finessing the ball top corner or anything. He's just smashing it in. You put blinders on him and he'll find the goal regardless, you know? That's been the best quality to have that I haven't really ever seen at Spartan in general, or even, you know, even in Portugal. He likes to float out to the left, as you can see from this heat map from SofaScore. And he does that so he can cut in on his favored right foot. With all of the matches I've seen him play in, which is far less than Danny, that's for sure, but sometimes given his pace, ability to take on players, and his knack for setting up his teammates regularly, he reminds me a bit of a physically strong, lethal striker who has some characteristics of a rapid winger. And typically, when a team is seeking out a striker, they aren't going to judge him too harshly on his defensive contribution. But hey, as a bonus, he's got you covered there as well. He never stops running. He chases the man down. And Mourinho is very big on playing like a Gagan press where when you lose the ball, you have to try to win the ball back. And Gilquetas is not the exception there. You know, he's not the star guy that we let rest. No, he's trying to win the ball back whenever he can on his side of the pitch, right? So he's been great on both sides of the ball. Okay, this is all well and good, but it can't just be all gas, right? There's got to be something that Gilquetas isn't stupendous at. He's not the best back to goal. One thing we do like doing is trying to start the counter attack. We'll push it up to him and he'll somewhat hold off the defender, try to keep the ball back and pass it. It doesn't always get to the, the result that we want. So I would say, you know, even looking at a guy like on our team, like Paulinho, maybe Paulinho has better back to goal than he does. But other than that, I mean, if he's running in behind you, you don't stand a chance really, so. No, as he has shown, very few stand a chance. He's a very well-rounded striker, as you can see, one that can score or set up, run in behind, out-muscle a defender shoulder to shoulder, or take them on with a pretty high success rate when the ball's at his feet. When it comes to his aerial ability, while well, he isn't winning a ton of duels in midfield, he can finish with his head. He's scored a few in the cup against Tondela and Leria, as well as in the league. But if you're looking for an aerial monster, you'll find that he has better suited attributes than that to other areas. If it's hold-up play you're looking for or a target man, then perhaps he isn't your guy. Play the ball to his feet and allow him to run at defenders or into space for him to run on two, and you'll have an absolute weapon. Over the past few seasons, with every step up he has taken, he has only improved until this point. If he's at 36 goals and 14 assists already at this point in the season, just imagine where he'll be in May. But anyways, I want to thank Danny for helping me make this Gilkeres propaganda video, just so we can ensure that we get this guy the hell out of Portugal so he can stop lifting Benfica's rivals. <laughs> in all the seriousness, a huge, huge thank you to Danny. Be sure to check out all things Alvalad, both on YouTube and on Twitter. Beyond that, I thank you for watching this video. And if you liked it and want more, subscribe. Other than that, Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next video. Take care.